Welcome, welcome, welcome to another Berean study. This is Dr. Ina McBride Silva, and we are going to be going into it, historical information about the church. Uh, this channel is dedicated to truth, to helping others as people who were Bereans helped me get out of the lie. Hallelujah understand what really happened with scripture um and really come into the amuna amuna is the hebrew word for faith um belief of yahuwah of the creator some call him jehovah some call him yahweh some call him yahuwah um we want to come into understanding yah Hallelujah. We're going to pray and we're going to get started. Father, I thank you for this wonderful study. Bless it. Breathe on it. Let it bless your people. Let it esteem your name. Let it bring knowledge, wisdom, and understanding to your people. Hallelujah. Amen. We're just going to jump right in it. Um, I watched another very compelling channel and the brother that was teaching brought out something that was very important that there are historical documents that point to the fact that the christian faith in itself deliberately broke away from judaism which we understand that most of us of us understand it but most of us don't understand that they established practices that paul would have absolutely not supported that peter would have absolutely not supported and we're talking about the founding fathers they themselves call these people the founding fathers um and so the early not serene believers lived a certain way and these were the people that were establishing the fullness of the assembly so we have to understand what has happened and then walk in our deliverance. So this video is to help encourage and deliver your mind, your mind, excuse me. So this is letter 70, 75 from Jerome to Augustine, all right? And this letter is linked in this PowerPoint presentation, which I will link with this video but it goes into detail in a debating fashion about the belief of catholicism and what they were standing for and what they were not going to stand for uh letter 75.13 the matter in debate therefore or should i rather say your opinion regarding it is summed up in this that since the preaching of the gospel of Christ, the believing Jews do well in observing the precepts of the law. The believing Jews, okay? They are observing the precepts of the law, i.e. in offering sacrifices as Paul did. And we read through scripture and we do see where Yahushua himself kept Shabbat. He partook of um, all the sacraments, the legalities of the faith. And now we're seeing Paul, the one that everybody harps on, the one that everybody jumps into his books without understanding, without reading the Torah first. That same Paul is clearly through Jerome to Augustine, viewed by even the Catholic Church as keeping the law. So I don't understand how they're saying Paul endorsed somehow not keeping the law. I don't understand that. I don't understand that at all. And that is absolutely not true. And again, I was watching another brother's channel. I looked up these letters myself. I will link them in. They are real. You can read through them. It's important to know your history. So we're looking here and circumcising their children. Oh, wait a minute. As Paul did. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. 
Are we clearly seeing in this letter from Jerome to Augustine that Paul did these things? It says here in the case of Timothy and keeping the Jewish Shabbat. Wait a minute. Paul kept Shabbat? Really? I thought he said, I thought the church established itself on. The law was done. Yeah, no. As all the Jews have been accustomed to do. If this be true, we fall into heresy of Serenthus and Ebion, who through or who though believing in Christ were anathematized by the fathers for this one error that they mixed up the ceremonies of the law with the gospels of Christ and professed their faith in that which was new without letting go what was old. And so here, now they're bringing into some other people. These people ain't established nothing. Here we see a Serenthus, Serenthus, maybe that's the better pr pronunciation, and Ebion or Ebion. These people evidently were trying to do what Paul did. Paul is a founding father. Peter, the 12 apostles. I would think they would know if they needed to break away from the law, especially Paul. Because if you really get into the study, Paul never said on any occasion that you shouldn't be keeping the Torah, the laws of the commandments. Because if he did, he would be an absolute contradiction to scripture. Yahusha never said that you shouldn't be keeping Torah. It's absolutely ridiculous that people are believing it and that I myself once believed what they preach, the heresy that they preach in Christianity that you don't have to keep the law anymore. It's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. But I digress, okay? Let this letter stand as a testament that somebody's lying and it wasn't Paul. And let this letter also be further brought forth as a testament that they hated the law and hated anyone that followed it, which is why they crucified hallelujah, Peter, and why they beheaded Paul. Because they wouldn't let go of doing it the right way. We clearly see this here in scripture. And when others tried to follow them, right, Serenthus and Ebion or Ebion, they were also considered heresy followers or heretics. Let's keep going on with this letter from Jerome because it's a long, juicy letter. Why do I speak of the Ebionites who make pretensions in the name of Christianity or in the name of Christian? Here's a typo. In our own day, there exists a sect among the Jews throughout the synagogues of the each, which is called the sect of the Mene. And there's a lot of history to that. I'll link the video that I watched that made me want to do some digging and see the letters for myself. He goes on to explain a lot about the sect of Monet. I won't do that. I'll leave that for you to research and find out. But the sect of Monet is very important. It's very distinctive. It is mentioned in scripture and it further adds to the authenticity and the validity of this letter. And it's even now condemned by the Pharisees because the Pharisees condemned the believing, believing Jews or the believing people from the tribe of Judah who accept the Messiah. The adherents to this sect are known commonly as Nazarenes, okay? There is another term you might wanna look into. They believe in the Messiah, the son of Elohim, born of Mary, and they say that he who suffered under Pilate, Pilate, Pilate rose again. Is the same as the one whom we believe. So now they're already putting a difference here. That the one that these believing Jews, and I would think they would know. Because Yahushua was from the tribe of Judah. I'm just saying. Okay. They're already saying that the one they believe in, they're saying is the same one we believe in. But while they desire to be both Jews and Christians, they are neither the one nor the other. Let that resonate. Jerome is categorized, categorizing these people who were of Israel, who were Hebrews, who kept the Torah. 
is not even being Jewish anymore and it's not being Christians. So Christianity is a totally new thing. Hear that. Hear that, those of you that are saying I'm following quote unquote Jesus, right? I'm following the Messiah. His name is not Jesus. I'm not going to be the name police and condemn you. I just want to make it clear that ain't his name. Because if you look it up and you translate it into Hebrew, you're never going to get Jesus. At best, you will get Joshua, which also should have been how it was translated in the first place. But I digress. His name is not Jesus. But if you want to use that terminology, let's at least connect him to the scriptures in the right way. Because what we see that Jerome is promoting here is a whole nother belief system. And what the Pharisees was promoting was a whole nother belief system because Yahusha kept Torah. Huh. He kept Torah now. Paul kept Torah. Peter kept Torah. And as we can see, the early believers kept Torah. They are in no way, form, or fashion redirected themselves to something new to some Christmas and some Easter. No, Leviticus 23 tells us our feast days. They did not reinvent anything. Hallelujah. This channel is dedicated to deliverance and dedicated to encouraging people. Search out the scriptures, search out historical documents and hear the wisdom of other brothers and sisters who've been where you are. I've been in the church. I've been misled. I've been confused. But I'm so thankful that I began to research and to study and to understand because this really is not a game. This is our eternity being played out. And if we don't make wise choices, we're going to be over there with the goats or some people are going to be over there with the goats. When Yahusha returns, who some call Jesus, he's going to say, I never knew you, you lawbreaker. We can't break Torah and then expect to reign with him. It doesn't work that way. And Jerome is clearly stating here that these people, these people, these Hebrews, or in this particular passage of the letter, the Jews that believed in Messiah and that kept the Torah, the laws of the Torah, they were not considered Jews or Christians. Hmm. But I thought Christianity was all about the way. These Nazarenes were also keepers or followers of the way. Let us continue the truth. The letter goes on to say, I therefore beseech you who think you are called upon to heal my slight wound. Remember in Revelations, we talk about the beast being wounded, which is no more, so to speak, than a prick or scratch from a needle to devote your skill in the healing art to this grievous wound, which has been opened by a spear driven home with the impetus of a javelin. For there is surely no proportion between the culpability of him who exhibits the various opinions held by the fathers in a commentary on scripture and the guilt of him who reintroduces within the church a most pe pestilential heresy. So he's calling keeping Torah a heresy. If, however, there is for us no alternative but to receive the Jews into the church, didn't want Jews in the church. That's interesting. Along with the usages prescribed by their law, notice he's saying it's their law, not ours. If in short, it shall be declared lawful for them to continue in the churches of Christ, what they have been accustomed to practice in the synagogues of Satan. Now he's calling the people of Yahuwah that they were in the synagogues of Satan. Mm, that's interesting. I will tell you my opinion of the matter. They will not become Christians, but they will make us Jews. Mm. Mm. Let that resonate, that there is a distinction. But the scripture doesn't make that type of distinction. The scripture says that Yah will always love Yaakov. The scripture even says in all the prophetic books that he's going to restore Israel. So how did you come up with something new? And I'm going to exit my screen and look 
some of these up before you just so you see it because I'm not making it up. There is no redemption because they put the they inter, inserted the word church in scripture. I'm going to tell you that. I'm going to put you on a chase. Look that up. Or maybe we can do a whole study on that and take that side road. But there is no such term really in scripture. That is something that was inserted. The assembly is in scripture. The assembly, the word ecclesia is there, which is an assembly, a governing body. Church is something new. Church was a new development. Mm. Yes, hallelujah. Hear me. Get on website like etymological uh, etymology.com and look up words and look up the meaning of words and let the father really give you deliverance. Let me put in here just a simple search showing you how you can do it. Let's go, it's real long here. And this is a future prophecy. It's from, and I just did a simple search before you just to show you how to do it. But now this is what Yahuwah says, the one who created you, Yaakov, the one who formed you, Israel, do not be afraid because I've redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they won't seep over you. When you walk through fire, you won't be scorched and the flame won't set you ablaze. I am Yahuwah Sabaoth, the Holy One of Israel, your Redeemer. And I've given Egypt as your ran ransom, Cush and the people of Seba in exchange for you, since you're precious in my sight and honored. And because I love you, I'm giving up people in your place and nations in exchange for your life. Here we go. The regathering of Israel, really? Don't be afraid, for I am with you. I'll bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I'll say to the north, give them up, and to the south, don't keep them back. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made, bring out the people who are blind, yet still have eyes, who are deaf, yet still have ears. Let all the nations be gathered together and let the peoples be assembled. Who is there among them who can declare this or announce the former things? Let them produce their witnesses to prove them right and let them proclaim. So people will say it's true. You are my witnesses, declares Yahuwah, and my servant, whom I have chosen so that you may know and trust me and understand that I am the one before me, no Elohim was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, yes, I am Yahuwah Sabaoth. And apart from me, there is no savior. I've revealed and saved and proclaimed when there was no foreign Yah Elohim among you and you are my witnesses, declares Yahuwah. I am Elohim also from ancient days. I am the one, and there is no one who can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? This is what Yahuwah Sabaoth says. Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Like he identifies. Do you understand that Yahuwah Sabaoth identifies himself as the Holy One of Israel? It's important to really read scripture. People are falling behind people not understanding scripture. This is a messianic prophecy. This prophecy is in on the way of being fulfilled fully, meaning that the regathering of Israel, the full regathering is going to happen. Notice he didn't just say one tribe. He didn't just say Judah because Judah refers to the Jew, the real Jews. Hallelujah. That's only one tribe. Israel refers to all 12. And there has been no regathering as of yet of all 12. 
but he promised that he would bring them from the east, the west, the north, and the south. And notice that even in scripture, it's the regathering of Israel. That's why they set up this nation over here to make you feel like that, that the scripture has been fulfilled. Yeah, no. The scripture is all about Israel. Hallelujah. It's never been about anything different. The truth is that people don't read their scripture. So therefore they fall into these traps of just listening to whatever people say. And yes, I am denouncing and, and, and really exposing the heresy of Catholicism and of Protestantism because they're both hand in hand. So now that we've looked at those scriptures, let's get back to the presentation and look at Jeremiah chapter two, verse four. Because the covenant is between Israel and Yahuwah. The covenant has always been between Israel and Yahuwah and it's not going to change. The beauty of the covenant is that anyone could join. It's always been that way. The other nations could join the covenant, but Yahuwah specifically established this covenant with Abram and his descendants. And from there, all other nations, that's why it says, in Avram will all the nations be blessed. Follow me. That's why it says that. Because while the covenant is made with Avram and his descendants, it is extended to the whole world, which is why Yahusha said, hallelujah, that he was laying down his life so that anyone could come. But it is a covenant. It is not something that just happens because you say, I believe. No, there are some conditions. And Jeremiah talks about what happens to Yaakov, or, which is another name for Israel, when they broke the covenant. So Paul would have never taught people to break the covenant. Paul would have never said to the Romans, you can start your own group called the Christians. Yeah, no, because the covenant was already established. Jeremiah chapter two, verse four says, hear ye the word of Yahuwah, O house of Yaakov and all the families of the house of Israel. Again, the house of Israel. Thus saith Yahuwah, what iniquity have your fathers found in me that they are gone far from me and have walked after vanity and are become vain? Neither said they, where is Yahuwah and brought us up out of the land of Egypt that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and of the shadow of death through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt and i brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodliness thereof but when you entered you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination let's talk about how they did that two and eight says the priest said not where is yahuwah and they that handed the law knew me not so it wasn't that the law was bad, it's that the people did not follow it. They did not know Yahuwah because to know Yahuwah is to know his laws. The scripture says in the beginning was the word and the word was with Yah. His word, his covenant, his statutes, his precepts, his commandments. That's how you know Yahuwah. So here it says, and they that handled the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me and the prophets prophesied by my own. So this doesn't sound like Israel was cursed because of the law. This sounds like Israel came under to the curse, which is in Deuteronomy, by the way. If they didn't keep it, they were going to be cursed because they were prophesying by Baal a different Elohim and walk after things that do not profit. That means they were doing other things than what scripture had designated, which is exactly what Christianity promotes. Christianity does not promote law keeping. It is the anti messiah that is promoting that. It is Hasatan in the earth that is promoting that. Let's go a little bit deeper here and let's look at the covenant. Because they didn't want to be Jews, but I already showed you in scripture, even here, old house of Yaakov. Ooh. Investigate, investigate. 
Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 11. And especially let's look at verses 1 and verses 16. Because we're going to get into understanding this covenant now. We can't walk around without understanding the covenant and then say, we really love Yahuwah. Because Yahuwah is about his covenant. And if you are going to be in his kingdom, you got to understand his covenant. You've got to believe that you are in covenant. Well, the Catholic Church is teaching that there is no covenant. There is no law. You just do whatever you want. No. These be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel on this side, Jordan, in the wilderness, in the plain over against the Red Sea, between Paran and Tophel, and Laban and Hazaroth, and Dizhabah, and Dizahab, sorry. And it came to pass in the 40th year, in the 11th month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spake unto the children of Israel, according unto all that Yahuwah had given him in commandment unto them. So Moses was reminding them of this covenant. We're going to keep going down here because I'm in Deuteronomy chapter 1. And I'm going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 11, but I just want to kind of read a couple of these things. One and 21 says, Behold, Yahuwah thy Elohim has set the land before thee. Go up and possess it as Yahuwah of thy fathers has said unto thee. Fear not, neither be discouraged. So this is when they were getting ready to come into the land. Right before they were getting ready to come into the land. But Father was also going to remind them that it is a covenant. It is a covenant. So I'm going to go ahead to uh, chapter 11. I'll stop at chapter four. Now, therefore, hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that you may live and go in and possess the land which Yahuwah Sava'oth, Elohim of your fathers, gives unto you. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of Yahuwah, your Elohim, which I command you. There is no taking it away. It even says in scripture, let's just, I'm going to give you words to just throw it out at you. It even says in scripture here, I'm going to just Google it. I'm not going to just give you the scripture. I'm going to show you how simple it is. If you can remember what I said. All right, and I'm going to type that name. He did not come to destroy the law. It's in scripture, Matthew 5 and 17. Just so you can see how to search it. You need to see how to search it. Not just see me say it's here. You need to know that it's there. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill. You know what fulfill means? They prophesied about him. For I tell you truly, until heaven and earth pass away, not a single jot, not a stroke of a pen will, di will disappear from the law. So the law is not done away with. They say, oh, well, Yahusha accomplished everything in his life. That's impossible. And they lied. Hallelujah. Are we in the millennial kingdom yet? Hallelujah. Has the regathering happened yet? He accomplished what Father set apart for him to accomplish. It is finished the work that he was sent to do. We also in this life have work that we have to do. And the ultimate plan of eternal life that Father is accomplishing is definitely going to come to pass, but all of it has a time and a season and all of it was prophesied out by the prophets. Even in the book of Revelations. Those are prophecies. So Yahuwah didn't come to abolish them through Yahusha. Mm. Stay with me. Let's go back. I was supposed to read Deuteronomy chapter 11. 
because that's where it gets super juicy because they are teaching people a bunch of lies and we got to expose it and we got to get out of it. If you're in Christianity, run. Therefore, thou shalt love Yahuwah and I, Elohim and keep his charge and his statutes and his judgments and his commandments always. Mm. Hallelujah. But they're telling you there's a difference between the Christian. There is. They're on their way to destruction. And it is what it is. You can't transgress the laws of Yahuwah and it be okay. Let's go back up to verse 15. And I don't want to say it like that because some are there and they're trying to keep commandments as best they can. And Yahuwah in his ultimate judgment has the last say. But I want to encourage people, if you are under the sound of my voice and you're hearing this message, really repent and seek to know Yahuwah in the fullness. Don't just take what you're being taught in a Christian atmosphere as truth. Because there are a lot of faults in it. And most of it is heresy. Hallelujah. Look at verse 17. Take heed to yourself that your heart be not, sorry, verse 16. Take heed to yourself that your heart be not deceived and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then Yahuwah's wrath be kindled against you and he shed up heaven that there be no rain and that the land yield not her fruit. And lest ye perish quickly from off the good land, which Yahuwah giveth you. Catholicism teaches you to lay aside the scriptures. It is what it is. And we cannot deny that fact. Let's keep going. Letters from Jerome. In this letter, it gives you the sources and it tells you again what Jerome was saying to August, Augustine, right? It was telling you, I have a little typo here, that he was admonishing people not to turn to the Father fully through repentance, which is what the early church fathers were doing but to turn to Catholicism, a totally different belief. And I'm going to get that typo out of there. Hallelujah. A totally different belief system because it wasn't connected to the truth. If we go back here, even at the very beginning one, it tells you, look at it again, Paul kept the law. The matter in debate, therefore, should I rather say your opinion regarding it, is summed up in this, that since the preaching of the gospel of Christ, the believing Jews do well in observing the precepts of the law and offering sacrifices, as Paul did, and circumcising their children, as Paul did, in the case of Timothy and keeping the Jewish Sabbath. So he kept it, and so did the believing followers, true followers of Messiah. They were also categorized is not being either Jewish or Christian, per uh, Jerome to Augustine or Augustine. It's very disgusting to read this and then to know how much people have been lied to and told that Paul was preaching something different than Yahusha and that he preached that the law was done away with. He did not. All those things have to be looking at in context of the audience who he was talking to and the depth, the meat and potatoes of what he was talking about. He was telling them that keeping Torah without connecting it with Yahushua was vain. So practicing Judaism is vain because that's what the Pharisees were doing. The sect of following Jews were condemned by the Pharisees. The Pharisees had the Torah. They weren't really walking it out in the fullness like they were supposed to. They were taking it and twisting it. And then they also rejected fully Messiah. So there's your problem. We're just trying to keep Torah, which is what Paul was addressing, without Yahusha, whom some call Jesus. That's what he was addressing. That's what he was telling people, listen. 
if you're gonna try to try to keep Torah without Yahusha, then that's vanity. You have to synthesize the information. Hallelujah. We're gonna keep moving here. Interesting facts about the Catholic Church. We're getting into the big potatoes. The Roman Catholic Church received plenty of attention in the year 2000 via the press when the Vatican published Dominus Aesus, a 36 page document which affirmed the uniqueness of Jesus Christ, right? So Jesus Christ is a different entity, even though some of you don't think so, uh, than the Messiah. But some of some people are really trying to follow Messiah and they use this name out of ignorance. But this was a different character that was created here. Let's just be honest with, with that because the Catholic Church really reinvented the scriptures. <laughs> they really tried to hide the truth, man. So they are affirming the uniqueness of Jesus Christ from the true Messiah, might I add, as well as the Catholic belief that their denomination is the one true bride of Christ. I told you, they don't believe Israel's gonna be redeemed. True believing Israel, those who keep Torah and believe in Messiah. Mm -mm. They're telling you that these people are not Christians. Hallelujah. See that. And in all honesty, that's true. Because most Christians, bless their heart, even though they say they love Yahuwah, well, I love God because they call him God. They disconnect everything that Yahuwah is from the scriptures and going to go off on another way. But let's keep pushing. The Vatican also published a note from Cardinal John Ratzinger, a perfect example here, uh, prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, in which he said the Catholic Church cannot be put on an equal footing with other denominations. The church in Rome is not their sister, he said, but rather it is the mother of all the particular churches. Mm, isn't that prophetic? Because I'm going to show you something. Revelation chapter 17, verses 4 through 5. Link to this verse is here. And let's look at what it states. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vows, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Okay with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. She, or so, he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast. Hmm. Full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and 10 horns. Hmm. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations hmm. and filthiness of her fornication. Hmm. Keep on going to verse five. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Can I tell you this is prophetically referring to the Catholic Church, even right down to the color of her array, purple and scarlet. If you haven't really looked into the colors that the Catholic Church way, wears, it's a lot of purple and it's a lot of scarlet because those colors are symbolic of things and we won't get off track. And if you're a Catholic, I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm trying to bring you to the true knowledge and the true understanding of who Yahusha really is and who he really is not. And this mother of harlots, scripture considers idolatry harlotry. I'll say that again. Scripture considers idolatry harlotry. And notice that it says she is the mother of harlots. The Catholic Church came right out and told you that they are the mother of all other denominations. And there are documentaries and historical evidence to suggest and prove that many other world religions stemmed from Catholicism, especially the Protestant movement. 
Hallelujah. Let's go back to the slide and take a look at further information. It goes on here because I want to point to you about what Catholicism does. It does a lot of mixing uh, of the Babylonian and Egyptian mystery religions into its practices. Let me tell you here, it states, and this is in several of the Catholic publications. It states that Mary is called queen of heaven. Remember that, because I'm going to show you some scriptures in Jeremiah where Jeremiah was rebuking his, the people of Israel about the queen of heaven. So she's nothing new because her son, who they call Jesus Christ, is the king of Israel. All of a sudden, now we're going to put Israel in the picture when we said, mm. but I digress. This is really in their literature and the heavenly king of the universe. Mm. But they're the one true bride and Israel isn't. Indeed, the Davidic tradition of Israel recognized the mother of the king as the queen mother of Israel. Mm. Source, Otto John edition, 1985 Dictionary of Mary, New York Catholic Book Publishing. Otto John edition, 1985 Dictionary of Mary, New York, and I put the same one, but there was supposed to be another one here. And it was from uh, another publication, but I'll try to re put that in. Um, this one's good enough. Um, this comes straight from the Catholic Book Publishing Company itself. Now let's talk about who the Queen of Heaven really is, per Jeremiah and per Hosea. Astarte was the name. She was the goddess, the queen of heaven, whose worship Jeremiah so vehemently opposed may have been possibly Astarte. Astarte is the name of a goddess known from Northwestern Semitic regions, cognate in name, origin, and functions with the goddess Ishtar in Mesopotamian texts. And of course, she is dis disconnected to Torah. The same way as they took Mary, the mother of Yahusha, who she had to practice Torah. Her whole espousal process, when you read through it in the Gospels, it was according to Torah. She was to keep up Torah. But yet they have disconnected Mary and put her in the stead as a disguise to keep people in the bondage of worshiping the queen of heaven the queen of heaven was a fertility goddess the queen of heaven is associated associated with the goddess ishtar in mesopotamia who also gave birth to a god follow me she was originally worshipped in Sumer under the name Inanna and was later worshipped by the Akkadians, Babylonians, and Assyrians under the name Ishtar. She was known as the Queen of Heaven and was the patron goddess of Iana Temple at the city of Uruk, which was her main cult center. Hear me. Mystery Babylon is Mystery Babylon, because if you follow this, Babylonians, the knowledge of the Babylonians was not all lost. And it is a mystery religion that the Catholic Church re or resurrected. Hallelujah. The Queen of Heaven. And they actively call Mary, the queen of heaven, when that does not support any type of scripture. There's nothing in scripture to support that. There's nothing in scripture to support those Hail Marys. Nothing. You shouldn't be giving homage to anybody except Yahuwah himself. Esteem and honor all goes to him. Hallelujah. We're going to look at Hosea 2, 2 through 11. We know that Jeremiah prophesied against her. Let's look at Hosea chapter 2. Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband, because Israel was in a lot of transgression. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. The father calls idolatry worship whoredom. 
he calls it adultery because he is the only one, the true Elohim, and he wanted his people to worship him as such. This is important because we had already revealed here that Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, Catholicism disconnects the people of Yah from the law, which the prophets were prophesying against because you are supposed to keep Torah and introduces gods and goddesses from the mystery religions, i.e. example, Mary, queen of heaven. The queen of heaven in Egypt, Astarte, Asherah, is the queen of heaven whom the Canaanites burn offerings and pour libations to. In Jeremiah 44, it's a problem. He's rebuking them for it. Ashtarte, goddess of war and sexual love. The Asherah pole is real. It's actually where the strip pole comes from. This was real. This was a problem. This was like sexual cultist orgy type of stuff going on. Um, shared so many qualities with her sister, Aneth, that they may originally have been seen as one single deity. Uh, I put it here, some pictures of it to show that this is ancient knowledge, the queen of heaven. Why would you associate something in scripture with the queen of heaven? Because I'm telling you, the whole deception is right in front of your face when you look. I won't go into Jeremiah 44 and open it up, but Jeremiah is opening up on the people of Yah and rebuking them for offering offerings and libations to Ashtar or Ashtar. This is just more on the queen of heaven. Hallelujah. According to the Sumerian stories, Iana was a daughter of the gods Anne and Enki. She was a goddess connected to the tree of life and the resurrection story several hundreds of years before the biblical Genesis was written. And this is a big contention here because people love to throw it off and say, well, the Bible just copy other stories. No, the Bible did a real account of the fact that there were other gods and goddesses out there. The Bible is so transparent. It tells you that Israel got caught up worshiping this stuff. It's not that the Bible is not transparent about it. The Bible is reasoning to people to get them to turn away from it. If you read through the scriptures, you will see that people have always struggled with sin. For comparison, in Diana's hymns to Anana were written at least 500 years before Abraham was born. And the worship of this goddess can be dated back to at least 3,500 BCE. Now this shows you right here in archeological evidence, they know Abraham was born. Did you catch that? At least 500 years before Abraham was born. The world was already into such corruption, which is why Abraham was so important. Because the people were carried away with the worship of these things per following Nimrod. Let's not forget. Let's keep reading. Better to show me a door. The author of In Inanna, Lady of Largest Heart, poems by the Sumerian high priestess found that both the imaginative Van Ditch and mainstream scholars such as Samo Parpola connect the origins of the tree of life to Inanna. In mythical tales and scriptures, Inanna is often portrayed with a reed post, which is interpreted as a symbol of the ultimate point of orientation connecting heaven and earth. This image implies a very positive spiritual interpretation of the unification of the earthly and the spiritual through the goddess and mentions no sin or punishment. I'll tell you, that has a lot to do with sex because this was a sexual cult. For the Sumerians, remember I showed you on the previous slide, that this is why she's holding a stick. Um, that this was a coat of war and of sexual pleasure. For the Sumerians as a goddess, Iana was a unifying 
force between all deities, a force which canceled out the debate between monotheism and polytheism. She was all, both the curse and the blessing. Notice that they understand it a curse and a blessing. Hmm. As the translator of Enhiduana's hymns to Inanna, Meador claims, and she is the divine matter for which all life has sprung, which also makes her divine mother, and she was worshipped as such. Hmm. Now don't look too close because you might miss it, but this really is referring to the Hail Marys. You got to see it. And being all, she was both light and darkness and quite capable of mischief. It was she who stole the mead, the Sumerian tables of law and civilizations from Inki, according to Joe F. Richard in Celebrate the Divine Feminine, Reclaim Your Power with Ancient Goddess Wisdom. The story is very similar. Now they trying to connect it in the wrong way to the biblical version of Jacob stealing the blessing from his brother, except that again, this version happened much earlier. So they will put faith and confidence in this and write books about reclaiming your power, the divine femininity, but then in the same breath, discredit the scriptures because the scriptures come with a Torah, with a law. This ideology around this goddess worship is lawless, which is why in Catholicism, they disconnected from the Torah. And notice I told you earlier, Mystery Babylon is the Catholic Church and the system. It's not just the Catholic Church either. It's the systems that emerge from this entity inclusive of certain nations and kingdoms built from the system of thought. The scripture tells his people, our people, the people of Yah, come out from her. In Jeremiah chapter 51, he prophesied about coming out of Babylon. It actually was fulfilled with the destruction of ancient Babylon as a nation, but it's also got a duality and a re-fulfillment as it connects to Revelation chapter 18, which refers to modern day fulfillment, daughters of the harlot. Notice I showed you in Revelations that she was the mother of all harlots. The Catholic Church openly admitted that they are the mother of all other denominations. All modern day Protestantism and denominations derive from Catholicism, and they all deny different aspects of the law and establish their own doctrine. From the seven day events, it's right on down, which also goes with something that Shaul wrote. And also goes along with what's written in 1 Corinthians and many more places. But I'm going to start with this one. First of all, I hear that when you come together as an assembly, because it really doesn't say church, there are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. And indeed, there must be differences among you to show which of you are approved. So there is going to be a sifting there is going to be a separation of the wheat and the tear but there shouldn't be just these straight out divisions divisions are not from y'all y'all calls us into unity of mind and of ruach meaning spirit so these divisions suggest a falling away which is exactly what is happening hallelujah the true believers of Yah are coming in and they're coming in strong. We're uncovering truth. We're reclaiming our Torah and we're walking it out as the other believers, as the not serene. And while we claim to be the true nation of Yasharel, the practicing Jews that do not believe in Messiah reject us and those that believe in Christianity reject us. Hallelujah. For there is only one way, and that is the way to follow Yahuwah. There's nothing new under the sun. Tradition is dead, and Yahuwah only will live forever. If you have any questions, I'm inviting you to type them in the chat. Things you want me to speak more on, I'm inviting you to type it in the chat. Or not so much in the chat, sorry. <laughs> in the comments. Hallelujah. I'll say that again. If you have any questions or concerns, I'm inviting you to type it in the comments. We praise you and we thank you, Father Yahoo, for the study. We thank you for the opportunity to share out your word and your graciousness and in your love. 
Let this be a Baruch and a blessing to your people. Hallelujah. Amen.